What's up you guys, this is Trips Exposing the Matrix and I'm Trip. Today's video is one that I've been putting together for a long time. I've really been trying to figure out what's the best way to present this information to people. And I, I know that this video isn't what my channel has usually been about. Usually my channel is about hip hop or uh, secret societies or um, the spreading of false information. I've even talked about giants and stuff like that. And um, this video goes completely along with my channel because this talks about false information, especially pertaining to the Civil War. But I want people to understand me and they, I want people to understand what I'm trying to say and I want people to understand where I come from because I think a lot of people are gonna be interested in why I have these views and why I think the way that I do. And I want to explain that the reason I do think the way that I do is because I'm mostly unbiased whenever it comes to this whole race thing. My dad is 100% black and my mom is 100% white. And I live in Texas. I live in the South. It's hot as hell outside right now. It's maybe one of the reasons I haven't made a video in a long time. It's just so hot. It's just draining my energy. But anyway, basically in this video, I'm going to be showing you guys the interviews uh, from former slaves and they talk about how terrible slavery was and then you'll get to hear um, an interview from a former confederate soldier and you'll get to hear him kind of like vindicate himself and I want you all to listen to this confederate soldier with a grain of salt because you have to understand that this is a man who just lost a war so he's gonna have to vindicate himself and he's gonna have to explain why he did the things that he did and um, I just want y'all to really take what this Confederate soldier is about to say with a grain of salt. And then I'll show some clips that talk about the daughters of the Confederacy who were the main perpetrators in spreading false information about the Civil War. And so basically the big message that I want people to take away from this is that the Civil War was 100% about slavery and the South was fighting over the state's rights to own slaves. And so some people will argue, oh, the Confederate Army wasn't fighting for slavery, they were fighting for states' rights. And they would be right, but they were fighting for the state's rights to own slaves. You know, the way I see it, people can try to twist it and make it seem like the Confederate Army was fighting for states' rights, or they were fighting for their heritage, or they were fighting for their way of life. Well, yeah, they were fighting for their way of life, which included slavery. And I've heard all the excuses from people who represent the Confederate flag still to this day. And I've tried giving them the benefit of the doubt. And I do give the, them the benefit of the doubt that they're brainwashed. You know, I'm not mad at people who still feel the need to carry around the Confederate flag with them. You know, I just know that they were born under an institution that was brainwashing them. You know, I don't walk around angry at everybody. And I've heard people who want to represent the Confederate flag say all kinds of things. I've heard them scream in people's faces, do you know how much a slave cost? Who was working that farm? Oh, my my family was. was. Who was working the farm? They were poor. Do you know how much a slave cost back then? Trying to imply that their ancestors weren't rich, so they couldn't have afforded slaves. But in this interview I'm about to play, you'll hear that the father of this Confederate soldier owned slaves. I've also heard people argue that, oh, you know what, the Southern way of living wasn't that bad and slaves actually weren't treated that badly. Well, in these interviews from former slaves, you'll get to hear just how bad these slaves were treated. Born to slavery. But we didn't have no property, we didn't have no home. And now we can hear them speak. Because you're nothing but a dog. You're not a thing but a dog. Found Voices, The Slave's Life, told by those who lived it. Tell you the truth, when I think of it today, I don't know how I'm living. I remember that just as well. Look like to me, I can't. We've been slaves all our lives. Your mother was a slave, sister was a slave, father was a slave. They know nothing about reading right there. All that I know, they teach you to mind your master and your mistress. Mom and them didn't know where to go. You see, after freedom go, just turn, just like he turned some out, you know, didn't know where to go. They are haunting voices from the past, not actors reading a script or scholars reading a text, 
but the actual voices of men and women, Americans, who were born in slavery. My name is Fountain Hughes. I was born in Charlottesville, Virginia. My grandfather belonged to Thomas Jefferson. My grandfather was 115 years old when he died. And now I am 101 years old. Incredible as it seems, we are listening to the voices of ex-slaves telling of their lives in bondage. Men like Fountain Hughes on the living conditions of slaves in Virginia in the 1860s when he was a teenager. Colored people didn't have no beds when they were slaves. They all slept on the floor. Had it here and had it there. Just like a lot of uh, wild people, we didn't. We didn't know nothing. Didn't like to look at no book. The age of the computer has reached back to polish a memory from another century, 150 years ago. Can you remember slavery days very well? Of course, I remember all our white folk, and all the names of them, all the children. Call every one of the children's names. Who, who did you belong to? Jim Bunton, the baby boy. The results of these digitally enhanced recordings are arresting, almost unbelievable. The idea of hearing the voices of actual slaves from the plantations of the Old South is as powerful, as startling really, as if you could hear Abraham Lincoln or Robert E. Lee speak. Listen again to Fountain Hughes, who was born in 1848. We were slaves. We belonged to people. They sell us like they sell horses and cows and hogs and all like that. Have an auction bench and they put you on, up on the bench and bid on you the same as you're bidding on cattle, you know. Here is 91-year-old Texan Laura Smalley talking in the 1940s about the outcome of a tussle between two women, one black, one white, one slave, one mistress. The mistress tried to slap the slave, but the black woman pushed her into a chair. Laura Smalley was a girl at the time, but she remembers vividly what happened to the black woman when the master came home. Well, they taken that old woman, poor old woman cat in the peach orchard and whipped her. And, you know, just tied her hand this way, you know, around the peach orchard tree. I remember that just as well, looked like to me, I can't, and around the tree and whipped her. And well, she couldn't do nothing but just kick her feet, you know, just kick her feet. But it, it just had her clothes all down to her waist, you know. Just didn't have her plumb naked, but they had her clothes down to her waist. And every now and then they'd whip her, you know, and then snuff the pipe out on her, you know. Snuff the pipe out on her. You know, the embers in the pipe. I'm where you'll see the pipe smoking. Blow them out on her? Mm -hmm. Good Lord. Mm -hmm. I was born on the 17th day of January, 1846. I go back as far as well along the early 50s. My first recollection of public living, and especially political living, as I may call it, was when I learned as a boy of nine or 10 that my home was in, in the state of Virginia. I didn't know about states before that time. Then, Time passed pretty rapidly because I was attending high school. And I remember distinctly the occasion when the John Brown, the poor man, sought freedom for the slaves. He's there in my state. I heard about it pretty distinctly. I felt sorry and yet sympathizing with my elders, I felt some resentment. Now, while some in my section, Southeast Virginia, I knew of some brutality, as I call it, exercised toward some of the Negro slaves. As a whole, the Negroes got along very well. Now, my father's Negroes, why I associated with them, that being the baby of the family, I didn't have any white children for associates. Therefore, I played around with the Negro children. Four years passed by. Then came up the great struggle 
when the Republican Party had become a, a power in the land. In 1860, Mr. Lincoln was elected, as you know. And I remember that uh, there was a good deal of excitement in my section, that the Negro slavery would be interfered with. Negroes would be set free and all that. <coughs> now, comes up the question of what we Southern soldiers fought for. My friends, as a boy of 16 and a half years old, I didn't think about any of abolition of slavery. My mind wasn't developed enough to take in what the politicians had in mind, and hence, there was no trouble as to the freedom of the slaves. About half of the Negroes, my father's Negroes, left and went to Norfolk to be under, as they considered, protection, but another half, 40, 50 of them, remained there and cultivated the crops until after the war. The South did not fight for the preservation or extension of slavery. General Lee, as is well known, was making arrangements to free his Negroes, and his father-in-law had already drawn up a part of his will, free his Negroes. My friend, it was a great curse on this country that we had slavery, and I thank God that I did not bring up my boys and girls under a system of slavery under which I was brought under. What did you boys fight for then? Here's what great many people do not know. That as a young man that way, I couldn't understand it fully. But I look back now and see my part in it and saw what we struggled for. And that was for states' rights. For states' rights. And as great many of you know, immediately after the war, the rights of the various states, well, especially in the South, were very much curtailed, if I may use that word. And since then, I have noticed you let things come up that encroach on the ordinary states' rights which we have preserved, and we find that the North, the boys at war, the blue are with us in preservation of the states' rights. Edward Pollard published The Lost Cause, A New Southern History of the War of the Confederates. It was the beginning of a series of histories told from a Southern perspective. A new mythology was taking shape in the South. According to The Lost Cause, the, the South only lost, not because she wasn't brave, the South lost because she was outmanned and outgunned. And because the North fought dirty, the ideas that Sherman and all of those people used dirty tactics, the South was gentlemanly, almost too good to win. The South really had no chance to win the Civil War, that it was simply fought for honor's sake. Everyone was noble and everyone was fighting for the right reasons, for a good reason, that it was right to secede. The South had never been in the wrong, according to Lost Cause adherents. The South had always been just doing the right thing and, and had a constitutional right to secede. This war, they said, was about states' rights and constitutional issues and nothing else. Well, what about slavery? According to the Lost Cause, slavery was a generous, benign institution. Slaves liked being slaves. It was good for them. They were good and faithful servants who didn't really want their freedom. Southerners defending the lost cause argued that the war was about states' rights, that it was indeed not about slavery. Confederate leaders never said that <laughs> during the war. It was pretty clear from people like Jefferson Davis on down to the lowest Confederate, Johnny Reb, what was at stake if the Confederacy were to lose its bid for independence, the destruction of the slave system. All one has to do is go back and look at the primary documents that were written before the war, to read the South Carolina Ordinance of Secession, to read the Charleston Mercury and other Southern newspapers that make it very clear that the great fear was that slavery would be eradicated. And slavery was very essential, a driving motivation of the Civil War. And slavery was not a benign institution. It was an institution that went against the ideals America claimed to believe in. 
But Southerners are not perhaps ready to accept this in the 1800s. Soon the lost cause becomes more than any sort of an academic debate. It becomes flesh and bone for Southerners. Southerners continue to mourn their dead. And women are very key to this because the sewing circles, the thimble brigades, became the Ladies Memorial Associations and later the United Daughters of the Confederacy. They brought Southern bodies home. They built cemeteries and they placed markers. By 15 years after the war, the monuments were no longer monuments about death and sadness. They were monuments celebrating military valor, celebrating the soldier, celebrating the fighting spirit. The idea was not to celebrate the generals, but to celebrate the common man. Confederate veterans reunions lended credence to this, the idea that all old soldiers were good soldiers. And all of these markers being put up by the daughters and the granddaughters of these old men, it went on from the late 1870s all the way to the 1920s. During this time, even academic historians were swayed by the romantic ideal of the Old South. If it had lost the war in one way, it was winning the war in another. It was winning the war in terms of memory. The United Daughters of the Confederacy and other civic groups that supported the lost cause were often the groups that approved textbooks for Southern schools. If a textbook didn't meet their standards, they would object to it in school board meetings. And so these textbooks went on for generation after generation in Southern schools, relatively unchallenged. In 1915, D.W. Griffith's film, The Birth of a Nation, reinforced lost cause values even as it celebrated the beginnings of the Ku Klux Klan. In the late 1930s, a best-selling book and a blockbuster film once again romanticized the Southern experience. Many people get their Civil War history from Gone with the Wind, which told a very Southern, very lost cause tale. By mid-20th century, most historians had become critical of the Lost Cause School, now being challenged by the civil rights movement. Just as civil rights blossoms, we also see many Southerners turning to the old images of the Civil War as a sign of defiance, raising the battle flags, for example. It wasn't really until 1990 in Ken Burns's documentary, The Civil War, that a very big public discussion began about what did the war mean? What did it mean for different groups of people? And what did it mean for America as a nation? And that Southerners should perhaps reconsider the lost cause. This is something that probably has held the South back in many ways, especially in improving race relations. We ignore the lessons of that war at our own peril as a people, both Northerners and Southerners, because the issues are still with us and, and will be for a long, long time. As a Yankee, um, we generally associate the Confederacy with slavery. Right, and I understand that, but you know, yes, slavery was a very, um, hot topic back then, mm -hmm. I guess you could say, even uh, 20 years prior to that, even, especially um, in the Kansas-Missouri border states, uh, the abolitionists and, and all that went on out there. The war was fought more, states' rights started everything, is what I feel. Mm -hmm. um, the South wanted to do things their way and the North wanted to control that. And that's basically what fueled the fire for South Carolina to succeed from the Union to begin with. This problem we see with false Civil War information can really be summed up with one word, vindication. And the thing I'm really trying to point out is that the Civil War veterans themselves were storytellers twisting truths and making the war seem like something it wasn't. And you just heard that Confederate soldier say, you know, as a 16-year-old boy, I didn't really know much of the politician's plans trying to vindicate himself. 
And so it's a real problem that it's not only, you know, the fault of the daughters of the Confederacy. It's a pro it's a problem that, you know, can be blamed on these war veterans themselves who are trying to vindicate themselves after they lost the war. And this really all comes down to one thing, which is that it's really awkward to tell someone that they can't be proud of their family heritage, especially when they've grown up being told for so long that their family's heritage is something to be proud of.